All right, so uh, hi everyone, my name's David and um, I work for Meta. And today I'm going to be sharing um, my journey in exploring this question. Is it a good idea to have BPF pass and handle um, thrift inside of the kernel perhaps? So seems like a good idea on paper, given all of the advancements that BPF have been making. It's able to do more and more inside of the kernel. And um, so for us, at least, most of our traffic inside of our DCs is going to be RPC using Thrift. And um, I know that at least for, for folks at Google as well, most of their traffic is also RPC. And it seems like a good idea. So you know, we, if, if BPF could pass and handle Thrift, then you could have internal consumers um, of these RPC requests. So you know, theoretically, that would allow us to offload some of the uh, hot work. It means that we might be able to drop um, requests early before they go to user space. And we may be able to reduce um, you know, some, some overheads with having, moving things back and forth, basically, between, uh, between kernel and user space. And the, the kind of general idea is um, you know, with the old BSD socket API, instead of consuming a um, you know, stream of bytes out of a, a TCP socket, for example, um, you will consume instead um, RPC, uh, RPC objects. So the first thing I want to kind of briefly go over is uh, Ktran, Katran, I don't know how you pronounce it, but um, basically it's our layer four load balancer and that's powered by BPF. And I want to look at this because I think it's a good example of what has been successful in the past, right? This is something that um, we deployed pretty early, uh, pretty early on and um, we still use it in production. And um, it's, yeah, I think it's a good example of um, you know, offloading work into the kernel using BPF and it's a good success story. So. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with how it works, but essentially um, it's, it's, it's a BPF program that hooks into a very early stage of the networking stack before the TCP uh, stack really runs. And um, the, the, the program can choose to drop the packet, it can send the packet to, um, to, a different, to a different IP, or you can receive it locally. And I thought about like what, you know, what makes it work what makes it work well? And I think these are uh, the, the list of things. So first of all, it's, it's pretty much stateless. You know, it's, it's looking at the packets at the layer four level, so you can treat each one individually. And the work, that each, the, 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 the work that's done for each packet, it's, um, it's pretty simple, right? It does some hashing, it reads some configuration out of um, BPF SOC maps, and then it decides to drop the packet for the packet and, and yeah, so the work is pretty simple, and most of the complexity is really um, inside of the user space portion of, uh, of this. So all of the configuration, the observability, and the monitoring, all of that lives inside of the user space. And the performance wins really comes from the fact that we can, um, we can do this very early on in the networking stack before, before the kernel has to process it. And uh, okay, so moving on then, to the thing that really spurred off this discussion, um, there was uh, a paper published, I think, in 2021. And um, some researchers, they built this thing called BMC, which is an in-kernel um, like in hot cache for memcache. And uh, Martin's not with us in person today, but he's the one who kind of posted this internally, and that kind of kicked off all of this discussion. You know, is this something that we can, we can actually do in, uh, in production? So the way that this BMC works, I read the paper, is um, they basically implement a, a hot read cache in the kernel, and um, it's implemented using BPF. And um, it only really supports the get operations, because that's your kind of like stateless operation. Um, and it only works if there is a hit, right? As soon as you have a miss, and for like updates or you know, other operations that are um, not stateless, it has to be then passed up to the, uh, to, to the user, space, user space process. Um, so yeah, I read the paper and then I tried to basically figure out you know, why, why does it work for them and I've come up with uh, basically these reasons. It's still like an academic researchy paper, so um, uh, th there's a lot of constraints or a lot of assumptions that they've made right, that kind of makes it work. So they're using the open source memcache, it's, uh, it's relatively simple, they only have a single server. Um, and they only support UDP for the GET requests. Uh, which means they don't have to handle um, TCP at all. And they've made some assumptions kind of binding the um, length 
of the keys and the values as well. And um, the paper also doesn't really mention, and I think that's like a recurring thing about academic papers, they don't really mention what configuration they use for the kernel. So I, I don't really know if um, mitigations are turned on, for example. So. Yeah, so um, it, it works for them, but does it work for us? There's no, you know, as I looked into it, I realized like there's no magic, really. Um, just by moving the work from the user space to the kernel, uh, the work still needs to be done. Um, I think when I first joined the team, I don't know, I had this impression that the kernel is like magical somehow, maybe everything, maybe every instruction just ran 10% faster. But as I spent time with uh, Andre, he really uh, taught me that, yeah, there is no magic, it's just code, it's just instructions. And you know, just by moving the work from user space to the kernel, it doesn't necessarily like yield anything. Um, so, like, where do these efficiency wins uh, come from? You know, in the case of uh, in the case of BMC, and they don't really mention it in the paper. They don't really discuss it. But you know, I have a few hunches, and I made like a list of what I think. Um, you know, where, where by moving the work, it really needs to you know do one of these things for it to be uh, for it to be an efficiency win, for it to be worthwhile. So we want to avoid system calls. We want to reduce context switches. We want to. Um, avoid copies and if we can skip the networking stack then that's great you know that's what catran does that's what bmc does and um, if we can also do things like reduce um, the amount of locking locking contentions if we can you know put work to the correct cpus then can we do per cpu um, operations that allows us to avoid um, locking and if we can increase the locality of the work keeping it hot on the cpu um, or if by moving it into the kernel, we um, we can do things like uh, we can then move it into the uh, move it into hardware to do hardware offloads. So, all right. So then I started looking into uh, you know our memcache internally, and you know would would something like BMC work for us? So um, I think the answer is probably probably no, and um, the. The, the, there's a couple of reasons, and I've listed some of them here. The first one is that even though our service is called Memcache, I think at this point it's uh, it, the only thing that it shares with Memcache is the name. It's Ship of Theseus, if you know. And um, it's, not, um, it's not like a single server. It's this massive distributed service, so that adds a lot of complexity. And our requests, like I mentioned earlier, all of our traffic is going to be um, RPC. So it's going to be Thrift. So in order for us to make it work, yeah, the kernel, or we, we need to be able to pass and handle thrift using BPF. Um, and then I, as I started talking to the Memcache team, you know, there's a lot of pushback from them um, because the fact that it's a distributed service and it, and it runs at a massive scale, there's just tons and tons of user space code that needs to run. Um, and again, these are all assumptions that can be simplified for the purpose of like an academic uh, piece of research. But you know, these are real problems that we face in production, right? So for every request, we have to, you know, there's like ACR checks. Uh, we have to do logging. We have to handle things like load balancing and overload protection. And yeah, just you know, all of that user space nonsense that needs to happen. And um, in addition, for memcache specifically, uh, there's just a lot of churn in the code. Like, Things are just happening all the time in user space. So, um, you know, I, when I looked at Catran, it's like it works. It's relatively um, simple, and there's not much change that needs to be made, right? At least in the BPF portion of the of the program. Um, I can't say the same for uh, for, for something like Memcache. Um, so like, let's say hypothetically that we could offload um, the, the kind of hot get part of memcache. You know, like I said, there's no free lunch. You don't really gain anything. So you know, what, what could make it more efficient? And I think the main thing is really it would allow us to uh, save some copying that could happen, right? So rather than copying from the kernel to the user, we can have the kernel um, pass and handle the thrift. And then, um, then we don't need to copy into user, right? There's only one kind of, you know, DMA from the NIC into the kernel memory. You then deserialize the thrift request, handle the thrift request, and then, right, that's only one, that's only one copying. Um, but it would only work for GET requests. Um, for anything that's stateful, you have to pass it through. And in order to kind of save that copy, okay, well, now we need to be able to deserialize thrift and handle the protocol. 
And um, like I mentioned earlier, we, we still need to be able to pass that request through to user space because we still have to do the logging. We still have to do all of this um, you know, user space stuff. And the, the real question is like, well, is this effort, you know, is that effort worth saving those two copies? And you know, I, I think, I feel like the answer is no if the only savings are from, uh, from, from the copies. And the reason for that is because another piece of work that I'm doing um, is kind of adding this uh, zero copy Rx support to the kernel. And it does it in a way that doesn't involve um, page flipping, right? So if we can, you know, if we can achieve the same outcome that is saving copies and we do it by using zero copy, then you don't need to really have the kernel um, handle thrift, right? And then you just pass, so you, so you save the copy, you pass everything to user space, then user space can do whatever it wants, deserialize, handle thrift, and we don't need to teach the kernel how to do it, and you kind of get the same um, efficiency win, right, by, by saving, those, uh, saving those copies. All right, so um, what about large thrift requests and you know, what are large thrift, requ thrift requests? Um, they're basically requests where the majority of the request, it's, um, it's like an opaque payload, right? So that is really destined to be, you know, going to disk or going to GPU memory. Um, and it's not meant to be uh, handled. So very, uh, only a very small part of the request, you can think of it as like a, um, you know, like an application header. So very small amount of the request is that. The rest is like an opaque payload. So the question is, well, can we, you know, if we could pass thrift in the kernel, then can we be very smart about it and kind of um, decide where that payload needs to go without involving um, user space? So as I thought about it, um, I've come to the unfortunate conclusion that, um, again, it's not really feasible. And the reason for that is um, the, the kind of thrift RPC request, it's, it's, um, it's like inline, right? As opposed to you know, having like a control plane and a data plane, which is, what, um, which is, what, which is how Ktran works. And the, so like the header part is really important because that's the part that you need to pass and read and you know, have some business logic run to decide where the opaque payload needs to go. So, you know, the, the kind of control and the data is bundled into one. So you really need to have something to be able to um, handle that upfront. So while the kernel could, once we teach it how to do BPF, it could receive the uh, request from the NIC via DMA into kernel memory, then the kernel we can um, deserialize and handle the thrift understand the headers and then decide where to go, and then we can DMA the payload you know, to the right place in the GPU or to the um, you know, right blocks on the MV MVME drive. So like, you know, we, we could do that, or if we, had, if we had zero copy, then if the only thing that we're saving is, is the copy, then again, I think zero copy makes that redundant, right? So um, you would have the NIC DMA the whole request into user space memory, then user space will deserialize and handle thrift as before, and then that can then decide, okay, well, we need to DMA the payload you know, to, to these places in the GPU. So like the fundamental um, number of actions remains, I think, unchanged. So um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that part's useful for, um, you know, I don't, think, I don't think teaching the kernel how to do thrift is, is useful. Uh, but what about, uh, what about syscalls, right? Like maybe we can save a few syscalls. Um, at least for Meta, that's not a real problem because um, we are a uh, we're a mitigations equals off kind of company, so syscalls are not super expensive um, for us. So yeah, that doesn't um, that doesn't really save us, and I don't think saving that warrants the complexity of uh, teaching the kernel how to do how to do thrift. Uh, but so you know. After reaching this point in my journey, um, I started getting like a terrible idea, which is, um, you know, what if we could split these uh, layer seven headers? What if we can split them using BPF? Really, really early on in the uh, in the kind of networking stack, right? So, you know, up to this point, I'm looking, well, can we split it inside of the kernel? 
and um, yes, we can, but it doesn't save us anything, right? We still have to do two, basically like two trips, you know, once from the NIC to kernel memory, and then once from the kernel memory to your device memory, right? But if we can do it really, really early inside of the NIC, right? Before the NIC has uh, run its DMA engine, before the NIC has chosen which queue um, to kind of read the descriptors from and to DMA into, if we can process it there, deserialize the headers, um, run some program like with application business logic that can kind of understand what to do, then we can like do something like this, right? So we, we, we have the NIC very early on, pass and handle the thrift headers. And then at that point, you know, the, the big opaque payload, we can now select the right queue and then, um, and then run DMA only once. Right, so then we can DMA the NIC, uh, DMA the, the opaque payload straight from the NIC into its final destination, whether that's in GPU um, or that's in like an NVMe drive or something. Then we, then we remove effectively one hop over the PCIe bus. And I think if we can do this, then um, it would improve the latency, right, in kind of getting the uh, payloads, let's say, into GPU memory as, as fast as possible. And it removes uh, contention over the, uh, it removes, reduces some contention on the PCIe um, memory bus as well, which is, uh, which is a real problem that's um, coming up. So in order to do this, um, you know, can it be done? Um, after talking to people, I think nothing really stops this from happening. Um, but yeah, we might need something other than TCP as the transport. Um, because we need we need the NIC to potentially, um, you know, we may, maybe we don't want the NIC to handle TCP. Uh, maybe we need like a simpler protocol, right? And we need the NIC to be able to reorder these um, reorder these packets as they come in, uh, because they may not be entirely ordered. And we would need the RFC protocol to really support um, streaming deserialization, which is something that Thrift can't do. And for these you know, big thrift requests, they could be you know, hundreds of megabytes big. You can't expect the NIC to buffer all of that. So you really need um, streaming support so that you only look at the, you know, the, 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 the very small part first and then decide what to do. And then once that's decided, the NIC can then you know, pass it on without needing to buffer the whole request. Um, you know, do, we, do, do we have the right sorts of smart NICs or IPUs to be able to do this? Um, do we have the BPF uh, instruction set bytecode uh, CPUs? I know that there was some talk about standardizing the instruction set and then, I don't know, building RISC-V CPUs that can do it. I don't know what the progress is on that. And um, what about encryption? Do we, need to, do we need these NICs to support PSP? But maybe more importantly, uh, should this be done, even if it can be done? Not all things that can be done should be done. So, um, I think it really boils down to the trade-off between, um, you know, what does it what does it gain for us versus the complexity, right, of um, of doing something like this, and this is especially complex because it's it's you know, anything as soon as anything requires hardware, you know, your your time horizon goes stretches out to you know five years, and as soon as your time horizon goes to five years, the the world can change drastically um, in the uh, in the meantime. Um, so a lot of this is motivated by motivated by the fact that you know AI is such a growing um, such a growing demand that's kind of putting pressure on the on the rest of the uh, you know on everything that's not AI. There's like a real capacity crunch. So things like efficiency is really really important right now. Um, but is that going to remain the case? Am I going to be able to do this in time before the next AI winter kind of wipes everything out and then you know now we, capacity becomes free again? Then nobody's going to care about this, right? So. Um, and then the final thing is um, I was really inspired by John's talk from yesterday about security and observability and he talked about you know zero copy is fundamentally incompatible with uh, security and you know for them they just kind of turned it off right because yeah you have no control over um, granting or denying these sorts of requests once it's set up so um, I discussed this with him yesterday, and I think that if we could, um, if we could have BPF run really, really early on the NIC, 
then in addition to handling the kind of business logic side, we can also run BPF that does things like security and, and observability. Um, because yeah, as you move more and more stuff, um, you know, offloading stuff into the hardware, um, then you know, without stuff like this, then you give up a lot of this kind of yeah control over the and control and view over the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there maybe easier things to do than this to kind of give us the same wins? And um, lastly, do I just live in a big tech bubble? You know, I've only worked for Meta, so um, it's very easy. It's very easy for me to view Meta's problems as you know the, the only types of problems, and I don't really know. Um, you know, is this something that could apply to other sorts of workloads at different companies? So that's something I'm interested in learning as well. Cool. That's kind of um, that's kind of all I had. So. Yeah. Is this a terrible idea? I'm ready to have my dreams be crushed. <laughs> I think I talked to you yesterday, but yeah. I feel like at least the framing should be done in some sense, right? Like this yeah. VC flow what and not waking user space until you have full RPC frame and so on. I don't know if it needs to be done in BPF or some maybe common TCP header support or something, mm -hmm. but right. something like this should exist. About the rest of the parsing thrift, I don't know. It <laughs> sounds crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you think that's a, why, do you, why is that a bad idea? It's because again, like, I, I, I think Cilium said that they do like HTTP header parsing using BPF. And then, like they decide what to do, right? Like based on those headers, they can decide to <laughs> route it somewhere else or whatever. So they do the mesh. I guess they have maybe some use cases, but I guess for you and for Meta, for Google, there's no overlay. It's all very kind of you don't need at all seven to decide where to go, right? It's mm -hmm. it, it, the the cost in a mesh is higher um, because there's multiple hops. So right. So like what people do in the service mesh is they say. I, I, want, I don't own the application, but I still need to observe and enforce security properties on it and routing and load balancing and circuit breaker and every other thing that you want to throw in there. Um, and so when you want to do that transparently or you want to do that when you, don't, um, when you don't trust the app, right? You don't trust the application. And so you need to find some sort of secure zone to do this from, basically. Um, and the way to do that is to copy the data, like the sort of traditional way, I would say, to do that is to copy this into a, just take the packet and copy it into a secure, app, another application that you trust, right? And that means, if you do this naively, it sort of means that you traverse an entire TCP stack, you receive it, like it, you just do like a whole other hop through the network, and then if you add encryption on top of that, you do a whole other encrypt decrypt cycle, right? You're um, talking about the, the sidecar stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, so that that's a slightly, I mean, I think from here, I don't see the same problem because you, you sort of trust your applications. This thrift thing is not like something you're trying to protect the network from, right? So like the, the cost dynamics are a little bit different. There's like, you know, trying to do BPF and then be, get rid of two copies and two encryptions, it's pretty easy to see the win, right? Especially with encryption because encryption is expensive. Um, so, so there's that piece. Um, and then I guess the other piece that, that, I, that we generally have trouble with is as soon as you enable zero copy, you enable backdoors, like back channels, because, um, because the data is already moved by the time you've made your enforcement decision. You know, so like, this is bad, but the data is already there. Like the DMA is not gonna, you have no way to tell the DMA to stop or somehow you know, invalidate it. Um, and so in that case, that's why we turn zero copy off um, in our environments, which, might become a problem if you're moving large quantities of data and you expect to move 100 gigabytes of data, you know, large payloads around, right? So. Maybe, maybe we need to sell you PSP so you don't do encryption at all seven. <laughs> you do it earlier and then it's... You can, you can go talk to the, the FedRAMP folks and the FIPS folks and um, <laughs> come back and let's <laughs> figure out how to make all that work. I'm, I'm, in Cilium proper, we also have, um, in the Cilium CNI, we have, a, we do IPsec, which is a very similar idea, right? You build a single IPsec channels between all of your nodes, and then instead of trying to do the encryption at L7, you do the encryption at 
um, at the layer below. So that's another option um, that, that sort of alleviates the encryption but doesn't alleviate the copy, right? And also doesn't solve the, um, the back channel that you can build with zero, with zero copies. So, um, and it, it, if you, I think as a, just a statement, as the best I can see is if you want to support zero copy Rx off the wire and you want to do it securely, in a sense that you want to be able to block that receive based on some properties, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> There's no way to offload that DMA in the current architecture if the B BPF is run after the DMA operation, right? It's got to be before. So you, you'd have to run it in front, which sort of implies that you're running BPF in front of the DMA, which means you likely have some sort of offload for B. It doesn't have to be BPF. To it be doesn't honest. have to be BPF. It could be some fixed function that you know, everybody yeah. agrees, right? Like, this is how it works. So yeah. I, I guess the question is, how much do you value zero copy, right? Like, how much of a requirement is that in the, right. in the network? And, and we're, right. like I said, we could just turn it off now, which is not great. Um, but again, yeah. these are not trusted applications either, right? So. Mm -hmm. And once we move to you know five hundred thousand G links, you know, do we need zero copy to keep up? Yeah, it's yeah. how many queues and cores and all this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I guess the other one is you start to get to InfiniBand and RDMA and, and NVMe offloads. Like, there's a whole set of things that also exasperate the problem, right? That that we don't see yet usually in generic like cloud environments, but I think you start to see in more yeah. specialized setups right now. Yeah. For, for things like RDMA and NVMe over Fabric, my understanding is that like, that's more suitable to the kind of traditional you know, controlled data plane. You set up the data plane, and once you set it up, you just let the data flow, right? But very little of our workload is, is, is like that. It's like death by a thousand cuts. It's just you know, these very small, relatively small RPC requests, and you have to pay this overhead every single time. And this sort, this sort of like traditional, you know, fast data path doesn't really apply for us. Yeah. Yeah. I think my my, my question was actually well, what I was thinking about is maybe touching on that, but also touching on like I think a lot of what you kind of figured was I can s like this BPF at the NIC or like at a lower level thing is trying to effectively eliminate copies. Like I think that was the primary thing you're um, hoping, and I guess. Stuff like zero copies seems to make that redundant. But, yeah. but you did mention like in the user space around like uh, ACLs or like load balancing and stuff like that. Yeah. So then I guess my question is, can some of those functionalities then move and, and does that change the, you know, for instance, if it's ACL and you can't do this, then you don't pass the, the thing on. Or like you're load balancing, where are you load balancing that to? Is that like between different devices on that host or is it to another mm -hmm. host? And in which case, I mean, Katran, I guess, is, is all about that sort of thing. That they yeah, do yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I, I think when I spoke to the, like, the, the internal teams about doing this, they were imagining, OK, let's just rewrite all of the memcache, including all of the logging inside of BPF. But I, I don't think like, that's the way you would do it. right? You would have some kind of data structures that could be shared between the kernel. I know, Alexa, you're working on the BPF arena thing. I don't know if that could be used right, to like, effectively share data between uh, kernel and user. And um, you could have that. You could almost have like an IOU doing like mechanism, right? Where the kernel is like, you know, I've handled these things. Um, you know, here are the request headers or whatever. Now, please, at some later point, like the login is not super urgent. It just has to be done at some point, and we don't, we, and we can't afford to lose it. But it's not something that you know you have to do right at the time of your handling request, right? So we kind of store the kernel pass that information to the user space. Then you could have some user space daemon that then reads that out and then does all the login into you know, whatever databases that we have. So um, <clears throat> one I wanted to comment earlier on, can you go back to this BMC slide? BMC, yeah. Well, I guess we ate this one another time, yeah. But, uh, and you mentioned all of the issues with this uh, academic like paper. Yeah. Uh, so what happened uh, in the meantime, uh, Kumar had been looking at it, uh, and so he made, like on top of Arena, of BPF Arena plus extra patches, he made the real memcache work on top of TCP with Amazing. real parsing and everything else. Okay. So this is like work in progress, and mm -hmm. well, and it's running in XDP, 
Yeah. Uh, so according to him, he has like <clears throat> he made this academic paper into like idea of this academic paper into actual something that he believes can be used in production. Martin, did you say? Uh, not Martin, Kumar. Oh, okay, okay. So he might share patches in in the month or sometime. Okay, that's exciting. Yeah. Okay. Just FYI. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I would love to look at that and benchmark. I, I guess my it, yeah. point that some of these ideas like might look like academic, but the years passes by, and well, this was feasible. 2021, and three years later, hmm, it might actually work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the only trouble is, it's like TCP. We'll run into the reorder and retransmit, right? So it'll work for UDP, but if your thrift is on TCP, you're kind of you won't be able to push it all into XDP, most likely, right? Unfortunately. Don't shoot the messengers. Like Kumar said, he made it work with TCP. <laughs> it was with, TCP. with extra K funks where he actually like goes into TCP stack. OK. We can have TCP stack and XDP? Yes. That's a cool win, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's exciting. I love. I, I love to see it and see if we can. Like, it's, this is the open source memcache, right? Rather than the. Yes. They don't work for Meta. No. Okay. Yeah. Then I love to see if. Um, you know, I think the problems around. Um, you know, all of the extra stuff that we do. Um, I, I. Yeah. It's still kind of like an open. So why? Why I believe work, it's real? But. Because we were arguing. Uh, he wanted more than uh, four gigabyte of Farina. Yeah. Because like memcache can be like. Right, right, right. It's mostly yeah. The whole path will be all in hundreds of RAM, gigabyte. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Okay. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you.